What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we have six must-buy dynasty assets. We usually do players, but we have like five players and then one pocket in rookie drafts that I think is worth kicking the tires on right now. Now, I will say, we're four days from the NFL draft. It's a weird time to make trades, but I do think it's a fun time to make trades, kick the tires on some assets that maybe people are forgetting about. Maybe people want rookie picks. And you can kind of offload them right now. There's a lot going on. Rookie picks are juiced. Veterans are at their cheapest. So let's talk through six assets that I think right now I'm looking around the dynasty landscape that I think are undervalued that you could definitely make a play for heading into the NFL draft. So with all that being said, if you enjoy, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. Let's go. Now I will say, for this video, don't be too thirsty, all right? You don't you don't have to make trades. You, you don't have to get anything done. Like right now, you can you could honestly sit back and wait till your rookie draft to really make a bunch of moves, but I think it's worth kicking the tires. There's like I think some people are getting antsy. I would just at least see and just do your due diligence on these players and assets. And the first one we're going to talk about, and there's nothing like there's nothing crazy profound here, but I think right now would be a good time to buy Christian McCaffrey. If you are a contender, you plan on winning in 2024, uh, and your running back room isn't that great, I think why not kick the tires on McCaffrey? Because when we look at the Dynasty life cycle, shout out to uh, at EK Baller on Twitter. He made this chart, and we're right there. We're like draft picks are at their highest, and while draft picks are at their highest, the contending pieces are at their lowest, right? No one is worrying about like what their lineup is going to look like in week one, how many points they're going to score in the regular season. Everyone is just looking on the young sexy players and McCaffrey is not that like he is a full like if we look at dynasty startup ADP right now also shout out to Deco uh, I believe it's the dynasty data lab I'll make sure I link it somewhere if we look at startups right now this is actually my startup I believe yeah this is actually we, we did a patreon startup of course shout out the patreon uh, with a bunch of patrons subscribers and McCaffrey won a full tier after your Brees Hall, Bijan, Gibbs area. And it's not that he shouldn't be valued there, but you're getting a big discount on the consensus 101 in redraft. Like he is the RB1 by a mile. If we look at wins above replacement, which shout out to Destination Devi, they have a really cool uh, wins ab above replacement model where what is war? I just want to explain this before we go into it. I think Jordan Backus, I think that's how you say his name, uh, made their war model, which is cool. Uh, as mentioned earlier, war stands for wins above replacement and is a great one measure statistic to capture the true value of a player. At the one week measurement level, war shows the win probability increase or decrease of a given player over a replacement level player. There are many calculations needed to achieve a player's war. Don't worry, we'll get that, to that in a second. But this single metric will show you how valuable a given player is over the replacement player at his position over a period of time. So it's like a great, like all encompassing stat of like how impactful was this guy to winning dynasty leagues. And something that I think that you're going to be really shocked by is in a format like this, where it is super flex, it is start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Start eleven, super flex, tight end premium. And even in a league like this, where there's a lot of premium on the quarterback, right? You want the quarterback, they're going to give you massive wins over replacement because, you know, your top six scoring quarterback, like a Josh Allen, is a huge, huge advantage on like a replacement level quarterback. And even still, Christian McCaffrey last year had the most total wins above replacement across the league and the highest wins above replacement per game. He was, bar none, the most impactful player in all of fantasy. Even in these leagues where you're starting three wide receivers and three flexes and two quarterbacks where it's putting a lot of weight on wide receivers and quarterbacks, he was still head and shoulders above the rest because of that gap versus the running back position where you can see nobody else on this list is a running back. So you can project him for that. As well, like if you look at Mike Clay projections, I don't have it pulled up right now, but he's projected like a full 70 points ahead of whoever you think the RB2 is. There's nothing else to really say besides like he's McCaffrey. Can he get hurt? Is he getting older and his price is only going to go down and down and down? Sure. But this point in the offseason when no one really cares about winning, you can definitely try and, you know, kick the tires on McCaffrey, especially you're going to have a team that went all in last year, has like no picks in 2024. They have like McCaffrey and Kelsey uh, and their team maybe sucks or they have like Aaron Rodgers and it's just like a bare bones team. Like I, I would definitely look around, see if the McCaffrey owner in your league is like a weird tweener and you can kind of like 
get them started on their rebuild by taking McCaffrey from them and, you know, buy him on a little bit of a discount. Because I imagine, like, with a lot of contending pieces like McCaffrey, like Kelsey, uh, like Devontae Adams, sometimes teams go all in and then they miss their window and now they're like, shoot, I got to start rebuilding. So I would definitely check the McCaffrey owners in your league and, or leagues, plural, and just sort of see where they're at in terms of their team. Like, let's see what he's going for as well. Uh, for these trade targets, I do definitely want to show you uh, example trades. We're going to be using DynastyDaddy.com. I'll make sure that I'll link this somewhere. Um, oh, this is not where I want to be. But you can see it takes trades from like real life uh, leagues. You put in McCaffrey. This is two quarterback leagues, 0.5 PPR, 1 PPR. And you can just scroll down and see what he's getting traded for right now. Now, I would be like the, the we're going to do a sell video. Something I would be really trying to dangle, um, pause, and trade talks would be the like 112, 111, 110. Like if you could do like the 110 and a little bit of a plus for McCaffrey, I would absolutely love that. Like one tw like if you could do like 112 and like Isaiah Pacheco for McCaffrey, um, I would absolutely love that. Now, this is like too much of cheese going on. I, you can some change for McCaffrey. That feels a little bit lateral. I want to know, like, can you get him for cheap, cheap? Uh, I don't like any of these really. I will say the only complaint I have about this website is I wish I could like when there, when it's a f like a four for three trade. I'm not just I, like I just want 106 for McCaffrey. That's too much. Come on, there's got to be something. There's got to be something that's kind of cheap here. 110 and future draft capital. See this I would do like Kenneth Walker in the 201. I absolutely love that. 107 and 307. I wouldn't love it. You could talk me into that if you wanted to do it, but I, I would really try like the top eight picks. I really don't want to move off of right now, but if you could do the 109 and instead of this, like being a 307, you could do like the 109 and like a late second. Uh, I would absolutely love that. Let's see. Is there anything else? I, I do actually just want to search like, let's do McCaffrey for like the 111. What, what kind of trades do we have there? Anything that's just like, God damn, man. Like I don't, I don't need these like 80. 80 part trades see this is, this is actually interesting 111 211 and like nick chubb um i would actually do all day uh if i was a contender let's also just look at let's look at 109 as well usually i don't spend this long looking at trades but i think it is interesting with mccaffrey like this i would do if you could turn your 109 and 207 to mccaffrey uh i would do that all day long like that is a very easy pick for me mix it in the 109 is like very close that's very close for me but I wouldn't hate it. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't hate it if that's on the table. One hundred nine on a future first. I wouldn't like at all. Uh, let's see. Is there anything? Else? Oh, uh, one hundred nine and Kyron for McCaffrey. I don't think I could do that. I mean, like this is just that's got to be somebody like restructuring a team. This one is good too. One hundred nine, a future second, and Jalen Warren for McCaffrey, uh, and a future third. So yeah, like that one hundred nine to one twelve area. If you can dangle any of those picks or. Uh, any of those running backs in that like Pacheco, Rashad White, uh, James Cook area and like tear up, I would like that as well. Now, moving on from that, our next must buy dynasty asset here is going to be Nico Collins. Uh, he is somebody where if we look at dynasty data, uh, his ADP was the 402 on February 22nd or 26th. And now here today, April 21st, he is now the 506 in like early April and now sort of rebounding back to the 504, but he is over a full round cheaper than he was like a month and a half ago. And that's obviously because of the Stefan Diggs trade. So I like to buy low here, you know, low relatively to where he's been. Uh, and Nico Collins really is just a, a bet on talent. Last year, he was like genuinely a top 10 wide receiver at worst, like in terms of real life talent, uh, in terms of ESPN's receiving ratings, he was the wide receiver three on the year. A uh, pretty good group with Ayuk, A.J. Brown, C.D. Lamb. He had the highest, or the second highest, no, third highest catch score on this list. People also underrate Nico Collins for an X receiver. His yak is crazy. He has, like, the highest yak score on this list. He's not going to take, like, end arounds and carries, but uh, after the catch, like, he's almost Ayuk-esque uh, in that sort of facet here. And then we look at, uh, you know, targets per out run, first downs per out run, and yards per out run. He was 14th in targets per out run. He was seventh in first downs per out run, second in yards per out run. He was the wide receiver seven in points per game. He was a dog last year. Now, that's not what we're really debating. It's uh, what, how does how do things fit with Stephon Diggs in the offense? And my my thoughts here is I think Tank Dell is much more of a loser than Nico Collins when it comes to the Stephon Diggs trade, along with Stephon Diggs. I don't think it really affects Nico Collins nearly as much 
than the other two. And here's why. First, you see, in Mike Clay's projections, he has Nico Collins as the wide receiver 17, Diggs as the wide receiver 28, Tank Dell the wide receiver 30. Nico Collins as well has less targets than Stephon Diggs here. He's just that efficient. And then you have to remember as well, like, it, he could be a guy that has, like, a 12-touchdown season. So if he has, like, a 12-touchdown season just because, you know, uh, I think projecting 26 touchdowns for C.J. Stroud there is a little bit low. Again, it's a 15-game sample, too. But you get Nico Collins, like, double-digit touchdowns in, like, a 17-game season, uh, and he could very easily be, like, a top-five wide receiver in a given year. Uh, on top of that, he is the consensus guy to be at the top of this wide receiver list in redraft leagues on underdog, by the way. Use code Ron on underdog. They have drafts right now before the draft. They're going to have BBM after the draft. It's all great there. With promo code Ron, you get your first deposit matched up to $100. So that link will be in the description and the comment section down below. It's all like I like using it as a gauge for Dynasty because that tells you kind of what the market feels like their 2024 projection projections should be. Now, when we take a step back as well, I think we've broken down the Stefan Diggs season in the past, but I did want to show you guys what Matt Harmon said, because Matt Harmon is like the biggest Stefan Diggs truth there ever. Um, and he kind of outlined it in his reception perception breakdown of Stefan Diggs, what he thinks happened. Because down the stretch, Stefan Diggs started his first five of his first six games, he had over 100 receiving yards. And then after that, he kind of fell off. Harmon then charted his 2023 season and he ended up with a 76 percentile uh success rate versus man 67th percentile versus zone 75th percentile versus press good rates but not stefan diggs rates which is a little bit alarming that he definitely did take a step back at the bottom there you can see from 2020 to 2022 diggs averaged an 80.5 percent success rate versus man coverage uh, including the all-time highest mark in reception perception history, 84.7% success rate versus zone, and 83.6% success rate versus press. Remarkably consistent and elite results. All were over the 90th percentile. As you can see, the 2023 success rates are down across the board. We aren't talking about a craterish drop, but it's a decline. The man and press coverage success rates dipped from the 99th and 97th percentile down to the south of 77th percentile. So he's definitely taking a step back. And then when we talk about the fit within this offense, Matt, also broke it down there. Again, reception perception, he does an amazing job. Um, and it says, on the surface, uh, pretty much talking about like Tank Dell and Stephon Diggs, they fit perfectly. Or no, Nico Collins and Tank Dell already fit perfectly. Nico Collins is the consummate X receiver and a player I firmly believe is on a superstar trajectory. He dominated on in-breaking routes last year and proved that RP was correct to highlight him as a sleeping star since his first in-season rookie report results. And Diggs doesn't bring much in the yak game but was one of the clear strengths of Collins' output last year. Tankdell gives you inside-outside versatility, but showed he can win as a vertical flanker last season. From early in his rookie year, he was performing near the top of the league on outbreaking patterns. Dell and Collins formed a perfectly complementary duo, but there was a clear room for one more needle-moving player who could work underneath and rotate with Dell between the flanker and slot position. So pretty much what he's saying is Nico Collins is the established X, and you're going to have Tank Dell and Stephon Diggs rotating between like slot and flanker. So... That, to me, tells me that Nico Collins' role is very secure. He's going to be the X receiver. He's going to have the same role as he did last year. Tank Dell working back from injury. They're going to be really the ones that are almost like cannibalizing each other. I still think that they're both going to flirt with like wide receiver two, wide receiver three numbers. But if any of them have the chance to be a wide receiver one and a top 12 point per game score, my bet would be on Nico Collins. And I'd be comfortable buying the dip on him in Dynasty. Now, in terms of what he's going for, I am very curious to see what trades people are making with Nico Collins. Because if I could get, again, that, you know, that fifth round value, I would. Um, if I would trade any future first trade up for Nico Collins, as much as I don't love trading future firsts away, uh, I actually don't hate that at all. Uh, Nico Collins and Dallas Goddard for the 112 and the 2025 first, I wouldn't hate it, but I don't I don't love that. Just really, really, just really for the, the fact that I don't want to pay for Dallas Goddard, really. Uh, in terms of like, I don't want to have to use a first to buy Dallas Goddard. Uh, what else sticks out? I mean, that's just an unserious trade in general. Uh, I, don't, I like Will Levis, but uh, if I could do that, I would. But I don't think that that's all that. Uh, I don't think that's all that real. See, this is what I would love. Like deals like this, fellas. Like again, we're gonna talk about it. I think Monday or Tuesday I'll have that video out. But that one oh, like that one ten to one twelve area. If you can do stuff like this, where you turn that into Nico Collins, go ahead. I think realistically, it'll be more like a two oh seven here, like a twenty five first to do it. But uh, I definitely do love that Pollard and Kirk. I, I don't know. I I think in like calculators, this will be even. But I would absolutely love a trade like this. 
uh, where you're just sort of like throwing two vets to get Nico Collins, who to me is like a legit stud. Um, let's pick out like one more that I like. Uh, nothing sticks out. Again, I don't like these like three. Now, if you ask me like what pick straight up, I, I wouldn't want to pay the 107. Like the, the 109 is probably the earliest I would do straight up for Nico Collins. Again, like those top eight picks, I'm not moving for anything right now. Uh, Metcalf in a second for Collins. I can't do that either. Uh, let's see. Give me one more. Give me one more good one. No. Godwin in the 211, I would do in a heartbeat. So, yeah, I would be doing stuff like this. Can you tear up from a wide receiver? Maybe it would have to be more like an early uh, early second, but definitely kick the tires on Nico Collins. This this one I love. Like This, this I think, is like perfectly fair, um, but I, I, I love this. Like If I had the 110 right now, I'd have no issue selling the 110 for that price. Now, moving on from that, we have a little bit of like a controversial one. I'm usually not the guy that is like by players who are in trouble with the law. But I do think that there is a unique opportunity with Rashi Rice right now. Now, before we talk about the weird like lawsuit he has going on and like him driving recklessly, what it comes down to is he balled as a rookie and we know year one production and year one like really good PFF grades all translates to being studs down the road. And as a rookie last year, he was the wide receiver 28 in points per game, but then he became a full-time player after week 12, or then he was at a 70% snap rate the rest of the way. Before that, he was like, we, we were literally doing the rookie wide receiver report and begging the Chiefs to make him a full-time guy because he would have like a 50, 40 to 50% like snap share or route share, and he'd be really good per route, but it wouldn't be high enough volume to start him on a week-in, week-out basis. But then from that week 12 on point, he was the wide receiver eight in points per game, like a legitimate league winner. Uh, he was very, very good last year. Per route, his stuff looks great too, where if we look at targets per out run, he was 15th in targets per out run, 11th in first downs per out run, 11th in yards per out run. Despite having a low dot, he was still super efficient. He was still commanding targets. I'm not, uh, I know his dot is a little bit of a red flag to people. I'm not as scared about him becoming like a, you know, Rondale Moore, Wandale Robinson, just like pure slot. I think that he has more upside than that. And I think that you can see that with his first downs per out run and how efficient he was despite that ADA. I think in college as well, he was much more of a vertical receiver. Now, when we look at his PFF stuff, he had an 85.1 PFF grade. In my entire database dating back to 2007, all we have in terms of 85 plus PFF grades in year one, Rashi Rice, Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Michael Thomas, Percy Harvin, Terry McLaurin, Justin Jefferson, Odo Beckham Jr. Everyone that has played in the league for longer than Garrett Wilson and Drake London has a top 24 finish. Everyone not named Terry McLaurin has a top 12 finish. Everyone not named Terry McLaurin or Percy Harvin have a top five point per game finish. It's a great list to be a part of. Even everyone before, like just having 80 plus is nothing but hits, right? It's Jamar Chase, Evans, Antonio Brown, Keenan Allen, AJ Brown, Alave, Demarius Thomas, Ayuk, Tyree Kill, Chris Godwin. Like it is a monstrous list. And you can see as well, his points per game, he had 13.3 points per game, which is better than Garrett Wilson. It's like right there with your McLaurin and uh, Percy Harvin. It's right there with your AJ Browns and your Chris Olaves. His yards per out run, also there with the rest of the studs, like your Percy Harvins, like your Jamar Chases, like your Chris Olaves. He was efficient. He scored fantasy points despite, again, being on a low snap share for most of the year. All really, really impressive stuff. Now, the important part is price. He is the cheapest he's ever been, where he used to be inside of the top 20 wide receivers on keep trade cut. He is now in the dynasty wide receiver threes area. He is the wide receiver 30 on keep trade cut. So I looked at the wide receiver 25 through the wide receiver 36. So that is your wide receiver threes here. And you can see he is the only dynasty wide receiver three who is under 25 years old in a top four pick and redraft. Again, we look at that underdog ADP. He is still going at 41.8. So he is going in the fourth round of redrafts and he's 24 years old. The only reason he's in this range, which we all know, is because of the off the field stuff. Um, and even then, I think it's worth the gamble because we'll talk about in a second, like kind of what to expect for him. But you look at these Mike Clay projections and Mike Clay has him as the wide receiver 14 top dog in this offense, even with Travis Kelsey, even with Marquise Brown. I don't like you have to remember the offense last year was bad. It was weird. We know Andy Reid and Mahomes, they like to air it out. They like to have one of the best offenses in the league. All it takes is Mahomes to have another MVP campaign and Rashi Rice will absolutely crush in that scenario. I'm not that scared of Marquise Brown. If you think maybe the Chiefs draft a wide receiver round one, you can certainly wait and see if his price drops further. But I think we're pretty much at the lowest point. Like again, he's in the wide receiver 30s area. I don't think that there's going to be 
you know what I mean? Like, what's the difference between wide receiver 30 and wide receiver 37, right? Like, I, I don't really know what the difference is there. So I wouldn't mind kicking the tires on him again, dangling that 112, that 201, and seeing what you can get for him. Now, when we look at the legal side of things, shout out to Drew Davenport. Uh, he does, he's like a, I think that he's a lawyer, uh, but he does fantasy football stuff on Twitter. Uh, and he kind of broke it down in terms of the legal thing. He said, first, I want to conscious everyone that we were getting reports about the charges, but don't have the actual code section. So nothing is all that in stone. He said, I, I also not seen the arrest warrant, uh, like being official. Like those are all kind of reports. Uh, let's see. Uh, don't read anything this, uh, into a warrant being issued. It plays in the media and sounds more serious to say warrant is issued and he can be arrested, but warrants are standard. Uh, so he got like a warrant and people were freaking out about it. A lot of these like aggregators were going crazy. Uh, but like pretty much I'm trying to just find the uh, the like main thing. But like, yeah, one one count of aggravated assault, count of collision involving serious bodily injury, six counts collision involving injury. Uh, obviously not good stuff, but it doesn't really seem like uh, he's going to go to jail or like do serious time. He said, unlikely the charges are serious, but keep in mind the biggest factor in any criminal case. What is your history? I don't remember Rice having any prior criminal or traffic history that matters a lot. What is the next step? Probably turn him in. Um, he will plead not guilty. Then the case begins. Will this be done before the season? Uh, I think so, but we really don't know that with any degree of certainty. Felony cases naturally take longer and have longer speedy trial requirements. However, based on their early strategy, I expect Rice to move quick. Uh, just my honest opinion. He said this is way worse than expected. He said, eh. The charge of aggravated assault is certainly not one Rice wanted to see, nor did he want to see eight charges. On the other hand, the multiple victims makes the multiple counts pretty standard. Uh, so let's see. What else? What else do we got? Pretty much, he like breaks it down. I think one to two games seems more plausible than it did before. I was mostly on zero, but I still think he, this gets pled down to a couple misdemeanors, a suspension, and a hefty restitution bill. I would say the same thing. We don't have to be perfect right now. So pretty much what he's saying is he's expecting like a very small suspension, if any at all. He also had something on his account where he brought up... Uh, yeah, Addison was going 140, Marquise Brown. Again, like, I, I don't uh, – I'm, I'm, I'm staying as impartial as possible. I am not advocating for these guys. I am not saying what they did is, like, not pretty crazy. Um, but we have, like, multiple uh, – a pretty big sample. One of these guys in prison, two of them didn't even warrant a statement from the NFL for their charges. So Marquise – or uh, Henry Ruggs, of course, a guy who goes to prison because he uh, – his was much worse. And then Marquise Brown and Addison got away pretty much scot-free. Uh, so he, it seems like, you know, he thinks it's not going to be as serious as some think. It seems like he has no prior history. And you're looking at a few game suspension. We're playing in Dynasty. I can stomach a two to three game suspension on a player who's supposed to be good. Um, it is always a weird topic. You know, uh, if like, I don't know, I'm in the business of playing Dynasty. I don't need to have like the most morally correct uh, roster of all time. And he's going for pretty cheap prices here. Like, yeah, if I could sell Kenneth Walker for Rashi Rice straight up, I would. I mean, this is absurd. Uh, I don't think that you're going to get that deal. But yeah, like, dude, if I could, if I could sell the 201, I would, I would sell the 201 straight up for Rashi Rice. Like, I don't, even, I don't even need that 212 back. Uh, but like, yeah, I mean, like Alexander Madison the 207 for Rashi Rice. Like, he, he is getting dealt for peanuts some places. Now, you might have an owner that is just standing on business and is like, I'm not selling him for these prices, but definitely kick around and just see. This is about like the most I would pay. This is the most. Like the the 110 and a small piece on top is the most I would pay here. Um, I wouldn't, and even then I wouldn't love it. Like, I mean, this is Elijah Moore, Wilson in a third. Like, get out of here. Um, this is insane too. Tucker Craft in the 202 for Rashi Rice in the 301. So I don't know. If you want to be like, oh, these picks are absurd. We're seeing, a, we're seeing nothing but real trades here. Uh, like Josh Downs in a third, yes. 204 for Rashi Rice straight up, yes. Uh, Rashi Rice and Kobe Myers for Godwin in 201, yes. So you can see, like, there's there's a lot of really cheap uh, prices for Rashi Rice right now. I would just kick the tires. Like, again, you don't have to get the deal done. Kick the tires and just see what's going on there. Because um, I do think that there are cheap deals to be had. And I'm not all that concerned about the idea of him, like, not playing football again or, like, getting... Uh, arrested or, you know, put in jail, whatever. Now, moving on from that, our next player here that I think you should buy, just bear with me, Justin Fields, all right? I would, if you're a rebuilding team, I think he's a great upside bet at quarterback where uh, you can just have him on your roster and he can pop during the season. You can like potentially trade him or you can keep him and there's a lot of value to be gained. Or there, there's some teams where I'm contending 
uh, and I maybe have like a Matt Stafford or an Aaron Rodgers at QB2, and I don't want to, you know, bundle up my 2024 first, my 25 first, my 26 first, and like go and get a Stroud or even your back end like Anthony Richardson guys. Like you have to pay the iron price for those guys. Sometimes you just don't have the liquidity or the roster value to make a trade like that. So what I do like is pairing, you know, if you have like a Stafford or a Geno, um, you know, you could even all the way go down to like Kirk, you know, those, Baker Mayfield, like those type of like QB twos that you know aren't going to be like top twelve or like top six scores in uh, in fantasy next year. I like to pair one of those guys with Justin Fields because then you get a lot of upside attached to kind of the stable floor of like a Matthew Stafford uh, next year. Now, of course, Justin Fields he gets traded to the Steelers. It's not great for his career. He's behind Russell Wilson. But the thing that we know is that we have a 28-game sample over the last two years that when he plays, he scores fantasy points. And that's very important. He was the QB6 in points per game over the last two years with 28 games played at 18.8 points per game. That is massive. Now, we have him in Pittsburgh on the Steelers. And you have to remember, Steelers, they traded draft picks for Justin Fields, and then they signed Russell Wilson for like less than $2 million or whatever. So they don't have much investment in either quarterback. Like, I know Russell Wilson's the one for now, but it, it wouldn't shock me if, like, after camp, like, Field either beat him out or after a few weeks came in. You have to remember, Russell Wilson's numbers weren't terrible last year, but the Broncos are eating $85 million in dead cap to get him off of their roster, which means if he was so good, that wouldn't even be on the table, right? Like, we haven't even seen the Browns get to that spot with, like, a Deshaun Watson at, at this point. Russell Wilson... He's not cooked, but he is what he is. There's not a ton of upside there. And you have to remember, he's either there's going to be a couple of ways that this can happen, where Justin Fields probably gets a chance to start at some point. That would be my guess. He gets a chance to start, whether that's week one. That seems unlikely. It could be like week six, week seven, week eight, if Russell Wilson is kind of lacking. You get Justin Fields in there. He's going to do one of two things for your team. Either he can just score points, like whenever he's in, you put him in your lineup and a top six scoring quarterback in your lineup at any point in time is like a massive wins above replacement value to your team that you just paid like a second and some change for, or he plays for a few games, he balls out and then you sell him where like right now he's like an eighth, ninth round pick in startups. You could sell him for like a fourth round value in that spot. So I think again, there's like multiple outs for you to either cash in or just use his points in your lineup at a really cheap price right now. Now I would be excited I know Arthur Smith has weird personnel tendencies that he's had in the past, and we hate him for the Kyle Pitts stuff and the Bijan stuff, but Arthur Smith, the GM, is actually very good, and that's really good for your quarterback, where when he was just the offensive coordinator with the Titans, he had a top, like, five EPA per play offense. You can see here, top five EPA per play offense. He was really good with Tannehill. Tannehill was, like, a top 10 quarterback during that time. They were fourth in EPA per play over those two seasons, and they were top 10 in scoring both years Arthur Smith was the OC. So I think in this offense, I think Arthur Smith's actually going to be like competent. Like I would say more than competent. It's going to be an efficient offense. Again, with Justin Fields, because he's a runner, we don't really care about the low passing volume. Like That's like the, one of the big drawbacks of an Arthur Smith offense. For Justin Fields, that works out just fine. And I think that he's more of the archetype that Arthur Smith has been looking for, you know, with these Desmond Ritters and Maricus Mariotas of guys who run and scramble. I think that's much more Justin Fields than it is Russell Wilson. Now, there's also going to be some, like, luster to the Steelers as well when we talk about the NFL draft in a few days. Uh, you have the Steelers currently, their favorite position to get drafted right now is minus 320 for an offensive lineman, and then it's wide receiver. So they could go wide receiver, they could go a lineman. That's going to help out Fields. On top of that, Schrager even thinks... Uh, they could take Brian Thomas in the first round. And if not, could that be a trade for Brandon Ayuk? They think that they could trade the 20th pick for Brandon Ayuk. So if the Steelers added like Brandon Ayuk or like a wide receiver in the first round or like a lineman and then like a wide receiver on like day two, we're cooking with heat there. So I really like that. I don't mind the idea of just like buying fields low. It seems like he's someone you can sort of just get for a bag of chips right now. Um, and there's a lot of like hidden upside there again of like what he can do for either your roster and your scoring, or you can sell him later, or he could rebound. Uh, I think that there's a lot to like. So let's see, in terms of what he's getting traded for, uh, I will say I'm not trading anything involving a first for him. Like, I, I would be really trying to see uh, what you can do here. Let's see, is there anything that sticks out? Like, I'm not doing a 26 first for Fields. Um, hmm. There's nothing... I mean, this isn't on the... But if you can do Aaron Rodgers in a second for Fields, I would. You're not going to get two-thirds in Aaron Rodgers, but Aaron Rodgers in a second for Fields, I would. Uh... 
Dobbins two seconds for Derrick Henry and Fields. I would actually do this if that was on the table. Um, what else sticks out? Yeah, I'm not doing that. Some of these are kind of wild, I'll be honest. Again, I'm looking to buy for like a... I don't think you're going to be able to do it, but if you can do like 207 in like a future second and maybe get back a third, I think something like that you could do. Um, Swift in the 211 for Fields, I can't get there. Hubbard and Derek Carr for Fields, I actually would if that was on the table somehow. But you can see, like I, I would be trying to lowball. Like Hyatt Carr in a third, I think I could do that as well. Uh, I don't love this. I wouldn't do a 25 first for Fields, even if I was getting Kamara. Um, does anything else stick out? Yeah, like Fields for the 205 straight up. Like if you can do anything like this, I would. Even though you're going to see our next uh, asset in a little bit is I actually like the early and middle second picks, but I wouldn't mind, you know, paying seconds for Justin Fields, especially like a late second. Like is there anything that's like the 210? Late seconds I don't mind uh, trading off of. Is there anything here that sticks out? No. No, nothing that crazy. But you guys you guys get what I'm saying. I, I would be trying to poke around with like seconds and sort of see what I could do for Justin Fields. Now, our last player we're going to talk about today, and I don't think you guys are going to like it at all, is someone you can get for like dirt cheap. And it's because everyone thinks he's going to retire. He's only like a year older than George Kittle. I know he hasn't been relevant in a few years, but he is like literally like dynasty tight end like 35 right now. Um, and that's Darren Waller. I don't mind if you are if you don't have a good tight end room right now, and again you're in a spot where you can't pay up for your like Kelsey's or you can't really pay up for anybody like that. I th I think a nice flyer is Darren Waller. When we talk about what he did last year. Again, there's like the looming gambling or not gambling. There's the looming um, him possibly retiring. You're gambling that he's not retiring, but again he's like virtually free. Like I'll check right now. Keep trade cut. Um, he's like literally in a spot where. Like you can, you could cut him. Uh, and it, he's he's tight end thirty five right now, uh, so he's like he's literally cheap uh, or, or free. Um, and even still, here's the thing: he was commanding volume last year, and that's really all I care about. He had a twenty percent target share, number eight among tight ends. He still had ten expected points per game, where you know he was the tight end twelve in expected points per game here, which is just based on your targets, your catches, yards, all of that. Your a dot. How many points should you have scored? He should have scored ten points per game last year. He did not. He also had just one passing or one receiving touchdown, and that's because the Giants were so terrible and their passing efficiency was awful. So it's tough to really hold that against him. But he can still command targets. I also like the idea of the Giants potentially either drafting a JJ McCarthy or a Drake May here, or you get a healthy Daniel Jones. I think Drew Locke is even a huge upgrade over the quarterbacks they were field, fielding last year. And you can have at least a more competent offense where if they don't draft a quarterback, they probably draft a Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze, who can at least play on the perimeter and free some stuff up for Darren Waller. This is still a guy that they, you know, paid big draft capital for and probably want to succeed. Again, it's really more of a flyer, uh, but you can see Mike Clay's projections here. He is Darren Waller as his tight end 12 here, and that's on 14 games played. If he had 15 games played, he'd be flirting with top 10. And that's just a 16% target share. And again, like a very empty offense in this Giants offense. So I think Darren Waller is someone you can definitely buy. We see like just like the price with these Mike Clay uh, fantasy point projections. He's the tight end 12, and he's the only tight end inside of the top 16 of Mike Clay's projections for tight ends. He's the only guy inside the top 16 that has under a 2,000 keep trade cut value. You can see there, 148 fantasy points projected, 1,347 keep trade cut value. That's like half of what Dalton Schultz is worth, which is like, you know, Dalton Schultz is like a replacement level tight end. So again, I don't mind taking a little stab at him. Um, and we also have Andrew Cooper, who I should have on eventually. Uh, but he really, really preaches the idea of wanting like pretty much like wanting a uh, a top two target in an offense at tight end. He said, uh, we're looking for guys who are focal points of their offense that have heroic se seasons. If you look at the top 50 tight end seasons of all time, they were all top two targets on their team. And if you look at the top 50 seasons over the last 30 years, 49 of the players were top two targets on their team. The lone exception is number 47, Martellus Bennett in 2014 with 128 targets behind. Alshon Jeffrey and Matt Forte. The reason we say top two instead of one is, well, the greatest fantasy tight end season of all time was Rob Gronkowski in a year where Wes Walker got 173 targets. There's more that goes in, into it than that, but top two is where we need to live for tremendous upside. So we're looking for tight ends that can be top two targets in their offenses, and Darren Waller can obviously be that. Like right now, their number one receiver is Darius Slayton, who hasn't even reported yet because he's looking for a contract. Okay. They draft a wide receiver. Let's say they go Malik Neighbors. Darren Waller is still competing with Darius Slayton for like the, the second most targets on the team. I'm fine 
making that bet again. I mean, we'll see what he's getting traded for. Like, I'm, I like if you can, I mean, can you get him for like a third? I think that's like what I, I'd be trying to like get him for like a third of value. Um, if that's out there, I, I imagine that uh, it has to be looking at Darren Waller trades. Yeah, like, look at, come on, guys. 312 for Darren Waller, KJ Osborne for Darren Waller, Miles Sanders for Darren Waller plus, fine by me, 406 for Darren Waller, yeah. Um, but you got, yeah, 312 for Darren Waller, 406, so we don't have to see anymore. Like, if you can get him for a bag of chips, I don't see why not, right? Like, again, if you're just in a rough spot with your tight ends and you can't really get anyone to give you, like, a Pitts or a Mark Andrews or one of the top guys, I don't mind going kind of late round tight end with Waller and then maybe taking a stab at like Ben Sanad or Jaheim Bell in your rookie draft and just sort of trying to strap it together um, that way. Now, the last asset we're going to talk through buying here is going to be early to mid seconds. Uh, we did a, a rookie draft of landing spots with JJ Zacharyson. And you could see once we got to like this 111 spot with Xavier Worthy, like we just didn't really even want to make these picks. There's just like a huge tier break from there's like 111, 112, 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 206. To me, all the same tier. Like I, I wouldn't give much of a plus to move from my 206 to the 111, even though the market would like force me to, if that makes sense. So I think we can kind of, you know, see a flaw in the market. There's something with the psychology of like the 111 being a first and the 204 being a second that has like this massive value discrepancy despite the hit rate of both picks not being that much different so you can kind of if you can sort of leverage the psychology of that you should now mike leone uh of established the run had a really really cool uh kind of like write-up here that he did on rookie draft so he said i wanted to keep this analysis simple he did like a, an analysis here where he had viable outcomes where uh Pretty much, he had uh, 264 fantasy points for quarterbacks, 171 for RBs, 177 for wide receivers, and 147 for tight ends. This is roughly what each position needed to score to be a year-end starter. Top 12 uh, quarterback, top 24 running back, top 36 wide receiver, top 12 tight end. Elite outcome. So you're pretty much trying to find, like, you're using your rookie pick. Are they viable where you can start them, or are they elite outcomes where you get... Uh, you know, your top six quarterback, your top 12 run running back, top 18 wide receiver, top six tight ends. So, like, what are your picks becoming, right? Viable season is kind of their floor. Elite season percentage is kind of their ceiling. And when we can see at the bottom what he says here, Mike Leone, it's possible that early second round picks are undervalued. They seem to carry a little more risk than late firsts, but roughly the same amount of upside. However, there's a pretty big value perception gap between the 110 and a 203. You can see why this may be if you look at the success rates by round rather than draft segment. This is something you can subtly take advantage of in trade markets. So what he's saying is like first hit rates are much better than seconds, but the difference between a late uh, late first and an early second isn't that much, especially because like we're talking about a 22.5% viable season percentage, which is like their floor. That's not a great floor in general. Like that's a quarter, right? And then we go to 13% in the early second. So the floor is lowered, but the upside is the same. And we're really just looking for upside bets in that range anyways, right? We're talking late first, early second. So why not go out there? Rookie picks are overvalued right now, but I will say I think early seconds are actually a little bit undervalued when we look at the board. So that's what I'm going for because, again, I think we're going to talk about it on Monday. I'd be selling my, like, 110 through 112s, and I'd be trying to buy those, like, 201s through, like, 205. So I am very curious. We'll look up here. Like, maybe the 204 will be a, a pick that we'll kind of try and see uh, what they're trading for because I think it won't be too, too much. Uh, I will say if I could get a 204 for Sam Howell, uh, I probably absolutely would do that. Uh, I would not do that. Sell Aaron Rodgers in a third for the 204. I think I would. Uh, what else sticks out here? I'm not trying to do anything too, too crazy. Like, I, I don't want to sell anything that I really... Like, Ty Chandler for the 204. I don't think you're actually getting that. But instead of a Ty Chandler, if that could be more of like a... Can you do Ramondre Stevenson for like the 204? Like a running back in that area? I'm not sure. What else? Trey McBride in 204 for Kirk. That just can't be a real trade. Dobbins in a future second for the 204. I'm good on that. Rashi Rice for the 204. See, that would be one where I'd actually be selling my 204. Come on. Is there anything where... See, I would do this. Dalen Jones in the 211 for the 204 and get a future second there. Like, the, we're talking, like, really small moves. But, again, like, these are just, like, I think... I would call them, like, savvy maneuvers I'd be looking to do um, before the NFL draft happens. Is there anything else stick out? Again, I'd be wanting to like buy pretty low here. I think I would actually sell downs for the 204, but that's like about the most I would pay. 
Musgrave for the 204, I'd be over that. I, I'd be all over that all day. Um, if you could sell like an overvalued tight end for the 204, I would love that. I don't like the Josh Jacobs one, but I think you guys got an idea of what I'm saying. Like I, I wouldn't, don't give up a real meaningful assets for seconds. Try and buy them for the cheap. Uh, maybe if you can, can you move back from the 110, like the 205 and like, maybe you move back from the 110, you add a piece in there and then you go back to the 205 and you net like a future first. I would love doing deals uh, like that. So that's going to be the entire list. I also did update on the Patreon. Like the whole reason I do these buy and sell trade target videos is because on the Patreon, I update the rankings every single month. And with the rankings is the buy and sell recommendations. So there's a fresh set where everything is locked in on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. You can find that in the description in the comment section down below, but everything's locked in where I have my top 250 dynasty rankings, my top 48 rookie rankings, buys and sells all locked in pre-draft. And then not next weekend, but the weekend after the NFL draft, I'm going to go in, update all the dynasty rankings, the buys and sells, all of that. Before that, like literally the Sunday, you know, of like day three, I'll have the RS grades and the rookie rankings all ready to go on there. So if you have rookie drafts coming up or whatever, my rookie rankings, my rookie RS grades will all be on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. But if you can't support there, just leave a like, subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next one. Stones, uh, like this froze, uh, ice cold, uh, oh, oh.